Hello. Break on through. What do I mean by break on through? I hope by the end of this talk you will see exactly what I mean by break on through and be persuaded that it's time to stop thinking about the city and start thinking about citizen science. Imagine <laughs> you are a very hungry primate. In fact, the bell for lunch has just gone. And you're squatting, and you see in front of you a tiny hole, and a small ant comes out of it, and you think, goodness me, that looks like lunch. That's not very satisfying. Just one ant at a time? I need something more. So you cast around on the floor, and you see in front of you a stick. What shall I use this stick for, you think? You look at your finger. You see it's too fat and stubby to go in the hole. And suddenly you recognize that the stick is the same size as the hole. And you think to yourself, aha, I am so frustrated with this desire to eat. I'm going to use the stick as a tool. And lo, you, a lowly primate, has suddenly discovered how to invent tools. That lollipop of ants is much tastier than a single ant at a time and much more satisfying. Skip forward 10 or so thousand years of evolution and think, I am now a rather lowlier primate, in fact a PhD student, a graduate student, and I'm sitting at a desk and I'm probably even more hunched than that primate we were thinking about 10,000 years ago. And if you look here, what you can actually see, if we can dim the lights a little bit, this is Michael Faraday. But this is Tom Weller. And the caption comes from a friend of mine who made a book of these images of us in the lab. This is Ross Springle, a collaborator of mine. What we're doing is taking the liquid nitrogen from this doer and siphoning it into a magnetometer that you can just see in the corner. And the magnetometer is going to become a very close friend of mine for a very long time. In fact, 18 months of hard work, 18 months of going into the lab, using an oven to cook a little piece of metal until it vaporizes, makes its way, this is the ytterbium bit, makes its way along the tube and condenses on a tiny piece of graphite. And why I'm doing that will all become clear. But what you should recognize is that the science that I'm talking about, in fact, pretty much any science, requires hard work. It requires time. It requires perseverance. But what I'm here to tell you is that the rewards are about as satisfying and transcendent as you can possibly hope for. This chap here. This is Cameron Onis. That's Niels Bohr and two of their collaborators. And they're actually in a laboratory where liquefaction of helium was first performed. Cameron Onis's idea was to take his laboratory where they were working on low temperatures, amongst other things, and specialize. And they specialized in very low temperature physics. They were very interested in what they could do at the very lowest of temperatures. The reason they were interested is because quantum mechanics was beginning to appear on the scene. Planck had had his amazing moment of vision that he ought to be considering the energy to be quantized. And so these guys were suddenly incredibly interested in the very low temperatures because at very low temperatures, the ideas about the uncertainty of the universe, the fundamental uncertainty of the universe, encapsulated in Heisenberg's uncertainty theorem, which some of you will have read about, that uncertainty at the very lowest temperatures, we can play with it a little bit. And we'll see how we can play with it in a few moments. Now, as a part of this work that they did at the very lowest temperatures, serendipity had a part to play. So Cameron Onis and his team were looking at very, very low temperatures. And some of the work that they were doing 
actually meant that they were measuring the resistivity of certain metals and they were observing the behaviour of that resistivity as they went down in temperature. And they were expecting that the resistance of the material, the resistivity, which is normalised for the geometry of the sample, would drop. What they didn't expect was that it would drop suddenly. And one day, when they were in the lab, you can imagine, in the lab, making some measurements, crossing their graph, and suddenly something very unexpected happens. The curve for the resistivity, dropping down as they'd expect to a point that suggested that there were some impurities in there that even at the lowest of temperatures would still remain, it drops off suddenly. Imagine that moment in your life when you first see something that nobody else has seen and keep that in mind. Now, how does this happen? We have a basic model for how this happens now, but we're still struggling with how it happens in some of the more complex systems where we can get much higher temperature superconductivity. And what I want to do is work with you for a few moments, if we can get the uh, screen fixed and change over to the overhead camera. What I want to do is something that we tried last year, and it's to see if we can model this idea of quantum fluctuation. So I'm going to need three volunteers, please. Can I have three volunteers? Excellent. One. What's your name? Alex. Alex, come up and stand on the stage with me, please. Just stand right there on that join between the boards. Daniel, right in the middle there. Jake, just here. <coughs> See that cross? Yep. Just inside that cross. You need to stand just here, Daniel, in the middle, where you should always be. Now, I am going to, in order to model this, behaviour, this quantum fluctuation idea, we're going to have certain dials that we can turn. The one, first dial we can turn is the temperature. So clearly we want to make them dance because making them look ridiculous makes me look better. So if you guys could just dance a bit on the spot. Let's make them dance on an average fixed position. Good. Let's turn up the temperature a little bit. Turn up the temperature a little bit more. They're probably going to be jumping a little bit around that fixed average position. Now, you're getting the picture. We're doing something that I love to do all the time, dancing, which is why Mr. Williams couldn't actually make reference to anything on Facebook. And they're pretending to be atoms. But what some of us in the audience know, in fact, probably most of us know in the audience, that some atoms, and this is where we again get on to that little town of Itterby in Sweden. Is, was it Sweden or Finland? Sweden. Thank you. If you could point your finger, just point your finger randomly in any direction, keep your arms stiff, and one thing that we're going to add is that when you've got lots of energy, you can move your arm around like this. You can turn on the spot. Just to try that now. How does that feel? Good. Now, what we're imagining now is that rather than just simply atoms, they are atoms with a magnetic moment, a tiny bar magnet, if you will, we might call it a spin. Now, above a certain temperature, these spins find it very difficult to interact because there is so much kinetic energy in the system that they don't talk to each other. But as we lower the energy, depending on what type of material it is, it might be ferromagnetic, it might be anti-ferromagnetic, they would begin to align and all point in the same direction if it was ferromagnetic. And in fact, they might do what they're doing now. And this would be a dynamic spin mode in the system, which we won't get into because I probably wouldn't be able to explain it properly. Now, I'm going to give them a very simple set of rules. Stop. Thank you. Face the front. Keep your arms out. Uh, point them in front of you so that you're, they're a bit shorter. That's it. Good. Now, what I'm going to give you is two very simple rules. In fact, one to start with. I want each of you to point in the opposite direction to the person next to you, please. You can either point up the stage or down the stage and nothing in between. Good. Simple. Easy. That rule was very, very easy to follow. Now, I'm going to frustrate them a little bit. What I'm going to ask you to do, Daniel, if you could just come and stand on this spot here. Now, if you just all point in the same direction for a moment, now, instead of Daniel having 
just one nearest neighbour on this side and one nearest neighbour on this side, he has a neighbour here and a neighbour here that are equidistant. And we now have a problem. Let's see if we can now follow the same rules. So wait a moment, let me explain. Daniel, those two chaps are going to come to an agreement about which direction each of them is pointing in. You need to point in opposite directions to both of them. OK, chaps, when we switch the system on, Jake's going to look over at you, and he's going to see that you're pointing forward. And he's going to, oh, I'm pointing the wrong way. Better point back. Now, what I want you to do, Daniel, is when they do that, you actually need to start agreeing with both of them as well, please. So, Jake, if I turn the switch on now. So, Daniel, if you would make a decision, please. <laughs> so you see how Daniel's waving his finger about in indecision? Humorously, that's exactly what, well, exactly within the confines of this model, that's exactly what happens when you take three nearly antiferromagnetic atoms and align them on a triangular lattice. Now, you could say, well, Dr. Weller, you could have two different types of triangular lattice. You could have a triangular lattice that is joined along the edges, or you could have a triangular lattice that's joined along the vertices. As it happens, those two systems can be generated in physical material systems. And rather than leaving these chaps up here uncomfortable, what I'd like to do is imagine that we turn up the temperature a little bit until they can all just get on with whatever they like and point in any direction. Here we go, turning up the temperature now. And then I cool them down again and they're going to have to make the decision who to agree with. So I cool the temperature down again. Now, if I go right down to the very lowest available temperatures that we have, <coughs> that are now in the hundreds of millikelvin and lower, then there is still something called the zero point energy. Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause for these chaps, please? <laughs> and because of that indecision, that frustration between that local rule. The local rule was you chaps have to agree with each other to point in opposite directions. Because of that, and because of that global rule, the global rule being the triangular lattice that they sit on, because of the frustration by one rule of the other, we have at the very lowest temperatures available these fluctuations. And it was posited by my supervisors that this idea of putting atoms that interfere with each other antiferromagnetically on a triangular lattice would actually lead to these fluctuations at low temperatures and that could, in principle, lead to cooperation in those fluctuations. So if you imagine, all of you were involved in that triangular lattice and I push Jake's arm, he's going to move a little bit, everyone else in the entire system has to move a little bit. Now that's the electrons all cooperating. And what we thought was, if we can get the electrons cooperating en masse, then we might be able to find a superconductor. And as it happens, I should have control of the slide, excellent. As it happens, if we can dim the lights, ytterbium, the atom that I was trying desperately to persuade in between the layers of graphite, graphite being a layered material, which will need it a little bit darker to see on this screen. We're looking down on the top surface of graphite here, all the way down perhaps, please. We're looking down on the top surface of graphite and you can see the carbon atoms at the vertices of tessellating hexagons. If we look closely, what we'll observe, in fact, we don't even have to look closely because it's quite a good picture, but we'll see that if we try to place any atoms in between sheets of graphite, because of the hexagonal structure, they would occupy triangular positions. So our decision, the hypothesis, the idea, the big idea behind this was to take ytterbium, which likes to interact antiferromagnetically, and graphite and combine them and cook them up. Make ytterbium occupy a triangular lattice by using the graphite as a substrate. 
as a framework for it. And so we're back in the lab with the hard done by PhD student whose back is bent now from so long standing over the magnetometer and from standing at his oven. And finally, one day, he manages, after visiting Dresden, finding out exactly how they do it, reversing the process, adding a couple of tweaks, and cooking up some ytterbium intercalated graphite. He then takes an X-ray diffractometer, and he looks for the signal of the interlayer spacings. Aha, there it is, of the C6 ytterbium. Some of you will have studied diffraction, and you'd recognize if you were to calculate from the two theta angle here and the index two, the distance between the different layers in this system. That's something that you guys could do straight away, no problem. But the next question is, does it superconduct? So I find myself making very good friends with this dot. This red dot is one piece of data. Imagine, this is the moment. This is the point when you are either going to sit and watch one more data set go by or something really amazing is going to happen. You're going to be sitting there. The data points come in, dot, dot, dot. And then suddenly, one drops. And what that shows is superconductivity expels magnetic field. If the data point drops much lower, suddenly I know that my material is superconducting. What happens? Lots of dots in a row. Lots of dots in a row, again and again, day in, day out. But day in, day out, we keep trying new methods. And eventually, one day, suddenly, this transcendent moment occurs. And the data begins to show this superconductivity. And it's that moment that if you ever have the amazing pleasure, the honor, to be the only person in the universe that knows that this particular material is superconducting, and possibly you are the only person in the universe who has ever in the history of the entire universe seen this material behaving this way, that, let me tell you, is a rush. It's so awesome that it makes me think of the doors. And this talk essentially is about the moment when you move from the area of knowledge that we have, the sum total of knowledge that we call science, and you break on through to the other side. This piece of data made my life absolute hell because suddenly I went from having no supervisor in the room to a supervisor in the room every single day. And at that point, you do start to get a little bit tired. But what I would suggest is that you go out and seek these opportunities because the moment when that data drops off like that is amazing, really amazing. And to have your data look something like a scientist that was to receive the Nobel Prize for his work in low temperatures is fantastic. And you get this feeling. I'm at the top of the mountain. Nobody else has got to the top of this mountain before. I've just stepped on the moon. Nobody else has stepped on this moon before. Think about that time when you look down the piste and it's snowed the night before. Nobody else has been on the piste yet. And you get to make the first tracks in the piste. Now, there's a little bit of serendipity at work. But let me put this in your mind. This is me, age 15, 16. A friend of mine used to bring nature into college. We'd sit and read it together on the sofas. I quite fancied her, that's why I read it. I'm your age, roughly speaking. That was my dream. And I was lucky enough to keep working at it until one day I published in nature. It was nature physics, but we try and ignore that. Now, scientists are not just people who sit in labs, although that's a big part of it. They are also explorers and inventors. They climb mountains, but mountains in their minds. And what I'd encourage you to do is to recognize that right now, you could be getting involved with scientific research. There are lots of opportunities here in the school. We're trying to make more opportunities. You can get involved with citizen science projects. My call to you is make things happen because it took me a long time to get from the common room to the publication. It needn't take you as long. This is Michelle Kine. This is a little piece of apparatus that would normally cost her $100,000. 
Just to illustrate the point that you could do it now, the Shrinky Dinks pack was the way that she thought up of doing it for about $5. What would normally cost her for this microfluidics chip here, you pump different fluids in, fluid moves around, some of you might have heard of microfluidics. She took Shrinky Dinks. That's a certain kind of plastic that you can heat up and it shrinks. She used a printer to print a CAD design on it, shrunk it down and found that those little lines then formed a pattern that she could use to etch a microfluidic set of channels that cost her a fiver. So you don't need lots of money to do it either. And a review of more than 230 citizen science projects, according to the BBC, <laughs> says that the involvement of volunteers offers high value to research policy and practice. So it's not just, oh, let's get involved. It's actually valuable science. So go out and do it. Thank you.